This is Nye's neighborhood. Just over the hill, factories, soon to be full of busy grown-ups hard at work. And this is Nye Street, Telegraph Road. And this big white house, this is Nye's house. And this is Nye. He's running down the stairs, though his grandmother told him not to. Ordinarily, it would now be time for Nye to go to school. But since it's vacation time, Nye is free to stay at home with his grandmother and play. It is now the dinner hour, time for the turning sound of latch keys to echo throughout the land as grown-ups arrive home from work. And this is Mr. Ackerman, Nye's neighbor and friend. Mr. Ackerman works at the big factory just over the hill. Nye always looks forward to seeing Mr. Ackerman. You see, some time ago, Mr. Ackerman confided in Nye a matter of great importance. Nye had begun to wonder just what it was that the big factory over the hill was making. When asked at first, Mr. Ackerman did not answer. He regarded Nye silently, and after a long pause, said only, Nothing of interest, Nye. Nothing of interest. Mr. Ackerman continued on his way. This, however, served only to pique the nine-year-old's curiosity. And upon arriving home, Mr. Ackerman found the little boy still following close behind him. I promise you, Nye, what goes on inside the walls of that factory is of no interest to little boys, or anyone else for that matter. Now please, Nye, I've had a long day, and I'm tired. And with that, Mr. Ackerman waved goodbye and disappeared into his house, closing the door firmly behind him. There was nothing for Nye to do but to stare for a moment at the closed door before him and walk silently away. Mr. Ackerman had never spoke so coldly to him before, and Nye was unsure of how to react. He did, however, know one thing for sure. Mr. Ackerman was not in the least bit interested in discussing what he did all day at that factory. Why? he wondered. Nye thought about the sorts of things grown-ups do not like to talk about. Usually, Nye had found that they fell into two categories. First, things that embarrassed or made the grown-ups uncomfortable. Second, and this was the good one, things unfit for the ears of a little boy. He would have to play it cool and wait until the time was right before asking again. However, it was upon arriving home from work the very next day that Mr. Ackerman found the little boy following close behind him once again. Hello, Nye. Mr. Ackerman opened the door and beckoned for Nye to come in. Once inside, Mr. Ackerman remained silent for a time. He sat Nye down at the kitchen table, clearing off from it several tools and a strange two-pronged object they appeared to have been working on, and he put some water up on the kettle to boil. Pacing back and forth across the kitchen floor, Mr. Ackerman appeared to be lost in thought, until at last, the small kettle came to a boil, and Mr. Ackerman began to speak. Do you know where clouds come from, Nye? Sir? Clouds, Nye. Clouds. Nye shook his head. Try as he might, Nye could not remember learning much of anything about clouds in school. So no one has ever told you? Hmm. <laughs> well, of course not. It is a secret. Mr. Ackerman cleared his throat in a manner of someone about to give a long speech. It has been said, Nye, that clouds are made up of fine droplets of water, or tiny ice crystals, which are continually evaporating, while new droplets of crystals appear through the condensation of water vapor. Wow! This is not true. Falling again to silence, Mr. Ackerman looked to Nye as though he were about to say something very important. I'm going to confide in you, Nye great secret. And the men who bear great secrets such as this nine must never, never breathe the word of it to anyone, not even to their grandmothers. But then, just as it seemed he was about to speak, something strange happened. The look on Mr. Ackerman's face changed. It was no longer one of dignity, but the look of someone who had suddenly come to his senses to find himself quite ashamed. And all at once, it looked to Nye as though Mr. Ackerman had changed his mind and was about to say nothing at all. Please, Mr. Ackerman, please, pleaded Nye, who in all his wildest dreams had never imagined that the big factory harbored a secret so important and could contain his curiosity no more. I won't tell anyone, I promise. Mr. Ackerman glanced at the little boy, and looking slightly defeated, he clasped his work-worn hands. It was quite clear to him that there was little hope of shaking the boy's interest now. Okay. I am a member of the Secret Society of Cloudmakers. My father was a cloud maker. My father's father was a cloud maker. And I now, too, am a cloud maker. Our clouds are distributed across the globe, Nye, made right here and sent wherever they are needed. 
shade people from an angry sun. This is our secret nine, our secret and calling, a solemn duty for which we must never, ever take credit. How come? How come? repeated Mr. Ackerman, searching. Well, you see, nine, a cloud is a powerful thing. As long as a cloud is considered a happenstance of nature, then it's a helpful and friendly thing. But should this power to create and control clouds be in the hands of all men, well, why it would be the end of us all. That is why the cloud makers have always been men and women without a country or a faith, with no allegiance at all, but to the clouds themselves. With that, Mr. Ackerman looked upwards with a gleam in his eye as though he could see right through the kitchen ceiling the cloud in the sky above. Our secrets are passed down from generation to generation, I. We pose always as ordinary citizens. Our factories disguised to look no different than any of the others in their midst. Why, as far as the outside world is concerned, our factory exists solely for the production of the three-pronged, one-slot widget. At this, Mr. Ackerman chuckled. Trucks full of these things travel to and from our factory all day. They arrive full, and so they leave. Of course, we do keep a good deal of these widgets on hand in case of a visit from the outside world. But who wants to visit the widget factory? Men and women toiling for hours on end with molten ore and soldering irons, riveting rivets until they can no longer even feel their fingertips. And if they did, they'd never be allowed past the front gate, not without an appointment. Are all widget factories really cloud factories? Mr. Ackerman shook his head. No, Knight, no. I suppose most any factory could be a cloud factory. You never know. And that's the point. No one does. That is, except for the cloud makers. You told me. At this, a flicker of shame returned to Mr. Ackerman's face. I... I live alone here, Knight. I haven't any with whom to share my secrets. The life of a cloud maker, Knight, it's a lonely thing. To the outside world, we must purposely appear as unremarkable as possible. We lead lives designed to attract very little attention. Sometimes, Knight, sometimes we attract no attention at all. Mr. Ackerman's gaze turned down upon the kitchen table. When you grow up someday, Knight, you'll come to understand that there are some things in life that, if you don't share them, well, they can fade. Grown men have been known to disappear into thin air. Though still in the room with him, Mr. Ackerman looked to Nye to be far, far away. You're a good boy, Nye, and I believe I can trust you. Mr. Ackerman trailed off, and with a look of embarrassment on his face, he knelt down to the height of the little boy. I think old Mr. Ackerman needs a little rest now. You won't forget what I told you here today, will you, Nye? Nye shook his head no. Okay, Nye, you go run along and play now. And so it was that Nye became the guardian of a great and profound secret. In the weeks and months that passed, Nye never looked at the big factory or the clouds above in exactly the same way again. The world seemed a new and exotic place to Nye, where new mysteries waited to be discovered around every corner. He would spend hours on the hill overlooking the big factory, watching the newborn clouds drift this way and that. In the evenings, he would sit out on his front stoop anxiously awaiting Mr. Ackerman's return home from work. Nye felt very lucky indeed to be the bearer of such a great and important secret, and dreamed someday of becoming a cloud maker himself. Cloud making seemed so much more interesting than the other jobs he had learned about at career day in school. When asked, Mr. Ackerman just shrugged. Not anybody can be a cloud maker, Nye. Sure, most anybody is capable, but the title of cloud maker is something that must be earned. Right now, you're just a passenger, Long for the ride. A passenger? This world, Nye, this world of men and women and little boys like you, you're nothing but passengers. Mr. Ackerman was quiet for a moment, seemingly struggling to find the right words. It's like, like a crazy carnival ride, gone out of control. It's all our fault. Your fault? Mr. Ackerman laughed a sad laugh. You know who built this crazy machine? Who's operating it? He asked. Nye shook his head. Grown-ups. Mr. Ackerman bowed deeply. We build the thing every day. Problem is, most of us don't even know it. Even though we're driving, we think we're just passengers like you. Or worse, victims. We're terrible drivers, the whole lot of us. But sometimes, Nye, sometimes a little boy like you grows up and finds that, despite everything, he can still see clearly. He finds that he can look straight ahead and steer the whole blessed thing. And when a boy can do that, he can be... A cloud maker? Anything he pleases. Nye thought about how before meeting Mr. Ackerman, he had been afraid of growing up. 
enjoyed how he spent his days and was yet to find a grown-up who did. Watching the grown-ups travel to and from work every day, he had witnessed looks only of boredom and stress upon their faces. Nye was always amazed by how well Mr. Ackerman was able to mimic this look of discontent, how well he was able to mask his heroic purpose and disappear daily into the ceaseless flow of adults who had made the whole idea of growing up look so unappealing to Nye in the first place. Mr. Ackerman was indeed so good at appearing tired and unhappy that sometimes, for fleeting moments, even Nye himself was fooled. And then, early one vacation morning, Nye awoke to find something horribly wrong. Mr. Ackerman's hat and briefcase were strewn upon his front lawn, and the door to his house left hanging wide open. Nye cautiously approached the house and called out to Mr. Ackerman. Mr. Ackerman? There was no answer. Mr. Ackerman! Nye called again, poking his head through the front door, and still there was no answer. The house was completely silent. Nye thought for a moment of asking his grandmother's help, but was afraid of compromising Mr. Ackerman's important need for secrecy. He would have to try and find Mr. Ackerman by himself. Nye returned to Mr. Ackerman's front yard and, gathering the hat and briefcase, cautiously entered the house. Closing the front door behind him, Nye placed the hat and briefcase upon Mr. Ackerman's kitchen table and began searching about for any clues as towards Mr. Ackerman's whereabouts. Finding nothing out of the ordinary, he returned once again to the briefcase. Hesitating for a moment, Nye decided that there was no other choice. The briefcase must be opened. After all, Mr. Ackerman might be in trouble. Nye gently released the latches and was quite surprised by what he found. Inside the case, a second slightly smaller case was housed. This one ice cold and made out of some sort of aluminum or other light metal. Upon this metal was etched the phrase, For authorized personnel only. Underneath this statement was etched a good deal more information. The etching was so small, however, that Nye had to press his face up against the cold case and strain his eyes in order to read it. Warning. For the ground transportation and containment of Nimbus, Stratus, Cirrus, and Cumulus clouds only, not to be opened in an unrefrigerated indoor environment. As Nye was straining to read the last part of the statement, his nose accidentally made contact with a small red button that he had previously not noticed. Suddenly, Nye's ears were filled with the sound of gears turning and a mechanical whirling filled the air. The case sprung open, and out of it flew a tiny and perfectly formed Nimbus cloud. It was the most amazing thing Nye had ever seen. The little cloud drifted upwards, drifting higher and higher, until at last it came to a rest against the cool tiles of the kitchen ceiling. Nye pulled out his chair and climbed upon the kitchen table in order to take a better look. From his new vantage point, however, it seemed as though the little cloud had not come to rest at all, but was trying to pass through the tile ceiling in order to reach the sky above. Nye noticed also that the cloud seemed just a little bit smaller than it had only moments ago. It was almost as if the cloud's inability to reach its proper altitude was causing it to somehow shrink. Then the words etched on the aluminum cloud case suddenly came back to him. Not to be open in an unrefrigerated indoor environment. What will Mr. Ackerman think when he finds out I destroyed his cloud? He had to do something, and quickly, but the cloud was much too high and well beyond reach. How could he ever get the cloud back down and into this case? Then, Nye thought of Mr. Ackerman's old-fashioned refrigerator. Perhaps this could provide some sort of refrigerated environment the cloud needed. Filling his lungs with as much air as he could muster, Nye began to blow the cloud in the direction of Mr. Ackerman's icebox. It's working! It's working! Nye blew and blew until the cloud was floating just a few feet above the refrigerator door. Nye was hoping that the cloud would be drawn into the coolness of the icebox. However, upon opening Mr. Ackerman's refrigerator door, he found no room whatsoever for the little cloud. It seems the refrigerator was already full, not with a single grocery, mind you, but from top to bottom with clouds. Clouds of every imaginable shape and size. Nye had to immediately slam the refrigerator door shut in order to keep them from pouring out. Just then, Nye felt the most amazing, cool sensation on the top of his head. The chilly little cloud had begun to lose altitude and was now hovering only centimeters away from his face. Nye grabbed the cloud case off the kitchen table and held it open beneath the sinking cloud. He closed the aluminum case around it and placed it directly back inside of Mr. Ackerman's briefcase, closing all of the latches. This is getting nowhere, thought Nye, who with a great sigh of relief decided to resume his search for Mr. Ackerman outside. Then a thought occurred to Nye.
What if early that morning there had been some sort of emergency at the cloud factory, one that required Mr. Ackerman's immediate attention, an emergency of such great importance that he was unable to pause for a moment, not even to close the front door or retrieve the fallen hat and briefcase that he had dropped in his haste? If such had been the case, then Mr. Ackerman would certainly appreciate having his hat and briefcase brought to him. Certainly he would, thought Nye. And so, Nye climbed to the top of the big hill, Mr. Ackerman's hat and briefcase in hand, and looked down at the great factory as he had done so many times before. He knew he'd never get past the guards at the front gate. At best, they would simply take the hat and briefcase from him and send him on his way. Nye wanted to see that Mr. Ackerman was all right with his own two eyes, and to see inside the cloud factory more than anything in the whole wide world. He had discovered some time ago that around the back of the factory there was a small hole at the base of the barbed wire fence, just the right size for a skinny nine-year-old boy to fit through. Nye made his way carefully down the hill as to not slip on the wet grass, climbed quietly through the hole, pulling the hat and briefcase behind him. Looking up at the smokestacks, Nye wondered if he had ever seen anything quite so tall. Standing right up next to them for the first time, he had certainly never felt smaller. Just then, Nye heard the sound of voices and footsteps coming from somewhere nearby. He looked around for some place to hide, but he could see none. Moving along the back of the great structure, he came to a single unmarked door and gave its knob a try. The door was unlocked, and Nye, hearing the voices and footsteps drawing near, slowly and quietly cracked the door open and stepped inside. What Nye saw then was at once the most amazing and beautiful thing he had ever seen in his life. Rows of singing, white-haired women sitting on a vast and spiraling assembly line, in front of each a small and perfectly formed cloud, floating only inches above a frost-covered silver tray. Men cranking cranks and pulling levers upon huge machines made of silver and bronze. Hundreds of workers suspended in midair by string, pulleys, and wire, pedaling upon small contraptions whose pedals and gears were linked to bigger gears, and those to bigger gears, creating huge cloud-shaped shadows that drifted over the men and women working a hundred feet below. He saw several raised platforms, upon which sat workers surrounded by huge control panels of blinking and flashing lights, buttons and knobs of every imaginable size and color, frost-covered golden tubes, housing hundreds of tiny floating clouds awaiting for inspection. Suspended from the ceiling, a giant clock with a sort that he had never seen before, flanked on all sides by a towering bank of gauges and levers, and rising above it all, on the tallest platform yet, he saw the Elder Cloudmaker, who from his perch high above directed the flow of the entire factory with graceful waves from his left hand while calling out through the megaphone in his right hand. Nimbus, 200 of 3,000. Stratus, 44 of 53. Cumulus, 23 of 413. And on and on. Nye realized that he had begun to shiver and noticed, also, that he could see his breath. Looking around at the singing, silver-haired women seated all above him, Nye noticed that their breath could be seen as well. In fact, upon closer inspection, it almost looked as if the women were singing the clouds before them. Putting on Mr. Ackerman's large hat and crossing his arms against the chill, Nye proceeded to look about the building for any sign of Mr. Ackerman. He noticed that every single chair in the building seemed to be filled, with the exception of one and that this one empty chair seemed to be the focus of many an anxious glance by the workers in its midst. Even the elder cloudmaker, directing the whole factory from his platform high above, periodically glanced worriedly at this empty chair from time to time. Indeed, this chair located high atop the only empty examination platform seemed to be a matter of great concern to all the cloudmakers. Crawling his way along the platform's back wall as to not be noticed, Nye made his way slowly but surely to the platform in question. He waited silently until he was sure no one was looking and climbed slowly up to the platform's top. Peeking over the edge, Nye could clearly see a silver plaque bolted to the back of the empty chair, and etched upon this silver plate he could clearly see was the name R. A. Ackerman. Nye suddenly became quite aware that every sound in the factory had ceased and had been replaced with a shocked and deathly silence. Looking up, he saw that all the work in the factory had come to a stop and that every last eye in the vast building was upon him. A little boy? In his shock, the elder cloudmaker did not realize that he was still speaking through the megaphone. Several of the cloudmakers began to slowly rise to their feet, and Nye, now aware that he might be in terrible trouble, collected the briefcase and ran as fast as he could towards the door through which he entered. Finding the door still unlocked, Nye made a hasty exit, not looking back even once outside, 
Hearing the growing commotion behind him, he made his way to the gate and squeezed himself back through the small hole. Once through, he ran as fast as he could up the hill and to the road just behind it. At just that moment, a fire engine with its lights flashing slowly turned a corner and began sounding its alarm. Having just pulled out of the engine house, the firemen on board were under the luring influence of the siren and did not notice the small boy as he climbed on board. Nye hit himself underneath one of the fire engine's big benches and, exhausted by the day's adventure, drifted off to sleep. He awoke a good time later to find a concerned group of firemen looking down at him. "'Don't you know that fire engines are a dangerous place for little boys?' asked a fireman with a kind face. "'You could have been hurt. What's your name?' "'Uh, Nye? You mustn't ever go near a fire engine when it's in use. If you were to come by the engine house some afternoon, that'd be a different story. Why, me and the boys, we'd even give you a tour. But when we're fighting a fire, that's business only for a trained firefighter. And even trained firefighters die from fighting fires. Do you understand, Nye?' Nye nodded his head yes, and the fireman smiled. "'Someday, Nye, you might even grow up to be a real fireman, just like us.' Though he tried not to show it, Nye shuddered inwardly at the thought of being forever subject to the whims of the fire siren. "'Well, you better head home, Nye.' Relieved, Nye stepped down from the fire truck, Realizing that he had a very long walk ahead of him, Nye started for home. As he walked, he reflected upon the day's events and became more and more concerned that something horribly really had become of Mr. Ackerman. Soon, the day began to turn slowly into night, and Nye noticed that though he had been walking for quite some time in the direction of home, things were looking less and less familiar, until soon they were no longer familiar at all. Nye realized that he was lost and in a part of a town that he had never been to before. The buildings loomed larger and somehow grayer. There were more and more grown-ups everywhere, all rushing to and from with haste and impatience. Nye was becoming worried that he may never find his way home. He had walked a long, long way, and his legs were aching as it was. He knew one thing for sure. He was tired and did not much like this new part of town in which he had found himself in. Nye gathered himself up and entered one of the nearby alleys. At least here, there would be less traffic and he could rest. The alley was dark, and Nye, moving carefully so as to not bump into anything, settled against the wall of the building, finding a nice, soft spot onto which to rest his head. It was almost completely dark, and as night settled on this strange part of the city, Nye wished more than anything to be safe at home with his grandma. He realized that he was hungry, and that grandma had probably already made dinner long ago. He knew also that once the dinner time had come and passed, she would have begun to worry. Nye promised himself that he would take only a short rest and then immediately continue on his journey home. And it was with this conviction that Nye's already heavy eyelids became altogether too heavy to lift at all, and Nye fell once again into the deepest and most pleasant of sleeps. What Nye did not know as he drifted off to the land of dreams was that the soft object he had come to rest against was not a bundle of rags, nor a trash bag. In fact, it was not an object at all. It was a man, a very tired and sleeping man by the name of Rudolph Abacus Ackerman. In a matter of moments now, Nye and his friend, Mr. Ackerman, will awaken and discover each other in the morning light. Nye? Mr. Ackerman! Nye rubbed his eyes for a moment, not quite sure at all of where he was. Mr. Ackerman, you're all right! You're all right! Cringing at the volume of the excited boy's voice, Mr. Ackerman squinted at Nye. I'm fine, Nye, I'm fine. What, what are you doing here? I was looking for you. Looking? For me? Does your grandmother know where you are? Nye shook his head. Oh, Nye, she must be so worried. Watching Mr. Ackerman squint, it occurred to Nye that the early morning sun was hurting the cloudmaker's eyes. He carefully retrieved Mr. Ackerman's hat and handed it to him. Mr. Ackerman thanked Nye, but did not put it on instead returning it to the ground where it had been. How in the world did you find me, Nye? Excitedly, Nye began to recount the previous day's events. As Nye spoke, the look of sadness that had taken a hold of Mr. Ackerman's face began to deepen, and from time to time, he simply shook his head. Finally seeming as though he could listen no more, Mr. Ackerman righted himself and silenced Nye with a wave of his swollen right hand. Please, Nye, please. There passed a moment of silence between the two. The excitement Nye had felt in recounting the story quickly faded. Nye felt the question he had been dying to ask since he awoke, bubbling up. 
What happened to you, Mr. Ackerman? Mr. Ackerman looked at Nye, and for a moment appeared to be at a loss for an answer. Nye watched as Mr. Ackerman's gaze fell first upon his shoes and then to the ground beneath him. Nothing happened to me, Nye. Nothing happens to me. The boy looked at him expectantly, waiting. I just left. I got fed up and left. You'll understand when you grow up. But the cloud makers, they need you. Mr. Ackerman looked down at the little boy before him and shook his head. We've got to get you home now. But Nye did not follow. He stood in place and looked up at Mr. Ackerman, clearly not understanding. Seeing this, Mr. Ackerman looked suddenly quite ashamed and stopped. He turned back towards Nye and quietly spoke. I'm not a cloud maker. At this, Nye found his head swimming and a great sob escaped from somewhere deep within. After all the strange and scary things he had experienced in the past 24 hours, it seemed he had found himself at last beginning to cry. Nye could not understand why, after all he had done, Mr. Ackerman would no longer trust him with the secret. And it was with the thought that he had somehow lost this trust that he could not bear. His face red with shame, Mr. Ackerman took the crying boy into his arms. Had Nye's face not been buried in the lining of his jacket, Nye would have noticed that, at that moment, Mr. Ackerman looked very, very old. Mr. Ackerman felt very much as if he should say something, but was at a bit of a loss as to what that something should be. There are cloud makers. I believe with all my heart that there are cloud makers. Why, just look up at the sky. What more proof could you need? As Nye's tears began to abate, Mr. Ackerman put a firm hand on the boy's shoulder and knelt down so as to look him directly in the eye. It's just that I, Rudolph Abacus Ackerman, am not one of them. I'm a widget maker. That factory night, it's a widget factory. That's all it's ever been. We make widgets there. Three-pronged, one-slot widgets. I didn't want to tell you because I'm not proud of it. I don't even like widgets. Looking down at Nye, Mr. Ackerman suddenly realized that the boy did not believe him. Look at my hands, Nye. They're worn. They swell up. It's from years of curing widgets, riveting rivets into slots, and molding metal prongs. There's no place in the cloud factory for men like me. But Mr. Ackerman, I, I saw the cloud factory. There are no clouds in that factory, boomed Mr. Ackerman, who, surprised by the volume of his own voice, cringed and continued at a much quieter and apologetic tone. I wish there were, Nye. I wish the heavens above it were one of those factories. But in that factory, Nye, there's nothing at all but widgets. And you, Nye, you must be sent home to your grandmother this instant. But Mr. Ackerman! And then suddenly, Nye had an idea. He crawled over to Mr. Ackerman's briefcase and opened it in the cold silver case within. What Mr. Ackerman saw then, he would remember for the rest of his life. A small, perfectly formed nimbus cloud drifting slowly skyward out of the open recess of his briefcase. Mr. Ackerman stood up and with his mouth hanging open and a look of shock upon his face moved towards the small cloud in order to examine it more closely. The cloud, however, continued to drift upwards and away from him. Not for a moment taking his eyes away from the rising cloud, Mr. Ackerman continued in his pursuit and Nye gently placed Mr. Ackerman's hat back on his head where it belonged. The two followed the cloud out of the narrow alleyway and down to the busy city streets, where the busy city dwellers were far too busy to notice the spectacle of a nine-year-old boy and a disheveled man marching behind a small nimbus cloud. The further along they went in pursuit of the cloud, the higher also it drifted. Mr. Ackerman never for a moment took his gaze away from the cloud, like a man hypnotized. And when Nye finally did, he found that things were once again beginning to look familiar. The cloud, it seemed, was leading them home. Eventually, the cloud had reached such an elevation that it was no longer distinguishable from the other clouds that filled the sky around it. It was at this point that Mr. Ackerman looked downwards from the sky and found himself at the gate of the great factory. The guard at the gate smiled warmly and beckoned for both Nye and Mr. Ackerman to come in, but Mr. Ackerman hesitated. He was no longer sure of what awaited him inside and was suddenly quite afraid. I'm just an ordinary man. The guard put a reassuring hand on Mr. Ackerman's shoulder and let him through the open factory gate. Now flanked on either side by the guard and the little boy who was still holding his hand, Mr. Ackerman began to walk tentatively forward and the awkward trio soon made their way to the huge double doors that marked the factory's entrance. Sweating profusely, Mr. Ackerman took a deep breath and before he could protest, watched as a guard pushed the huge factory doors wide open. 
What Mr. Ackerman saw then was at once the most amazing and beautiful thing he had ever seen. Men cranking cranks and pulling levers upon huge machines made of silver and bronze. Giant fans blowing the larger, completed clouds towards smokestacks high along the factory's vast ceiling, creating huge cloud-shaped shadows that drifted over the men and women working a hundred feet below. Nimbus, 200 of 3,000. Stratus, 44 of 53. Cumulus, 27 of 413. Nine, tugging at a sleeve, Mr. Ackerman entered the cloud factory, and the whole of the cloud makers in their hundreds turned to face him. On his platform high above, the elder cloud maker stopped conducting for a moment and smiled. As the look of astonishment on Mr. Ackerman's face began slowly to turn to a smile, I realized that he had never truly seen Mr. Ackerman smile before. And now, as his misty eyes gratefully surveyed the hundreds of cloud makers in his midst, I saw a single drop of moisture fall upon Mr. Ackerman's cheek. Now, whether this was a drop of precipitation from one of the great clouds above, or a single tear of his own, he could hardly guess. As Rudolph Abacus Ackerman smiled the biggest smile that Nye had ever seen, and began to work. <laughs>